Okay, so let's start. Welcome to We've Got Issues, girl. We had, a, we had some issues, but here we are. <laughs> We're a weekly podcast for women who are curious about politics. My name is Carrie. And my name is Sky, and today we're joined by Ohio State Rep Lisa Sebecki. We are huge fans. We're so excited that you were able to come on last minute. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your district. Well, first of all, I want to thank both of you. You can I I am your fans because <laughs> I love watching Girls We've Got Issues, and and you guys always navigate through those issues, but I'm state representative Lisa Sebecki and I represent the 45th House District. Um, I'm going to just dispel a few myths. Um, I still live in Point Place. I do not work in Washington, D.C. I work <laughs> in Columbus. That's where my house district goes to work at. Um, the 45th House District is, like I said, Point Place, Washington Township, Washington Local. If you really just take that 475 and go all the way to the border. Um, that's my house district. And if you drive down Lexus Road, Clover Drive is kind of like the borderline there that goes into that other district <laughs> that Nancy Larson's going to win. She's going to win, yeah. Um, sure. And then I have a little, she is just did a bang up job. Uh, but I have a little sliver over on the east side of um, Toledo in the Birmingham area. Uh, Okay. Served for about eight years on Toledo Board of Education, took a little bit of a break to watch my boys finish up high school and not be a hypocrite of what I always tell every parent when I was on the school board is, you need to watch your high schooler. <laughs> they do not want you around. That's exactly why you need to be around. <laughs> <laughs> and so I made myself around and kind of cramped their style a little bit, probably. Uh, but, um, and then... Um, the opening came and Senator, oh, then Representative Fetter, now Senator Fetter had term limited out and I said, this is a great opportunity to uh, take my mom on a mission, now my grandma on a mission to down to Columbus. Yeah. Awesome. So this is your, you're in the middle of your reelection. So you've already mm -hmm. served one two year term. So you're running for reelection for another two year term. Um, but you already said that this wasn't your first campaign because you um, had served on school board before. So tell us how you, like, tell us back up to the beginning and tell us how you even got started in politics and why you got started in school board. Okay. Uh, well, my uh -oh, boys, um, at the age of three, my oldest son, I put him, in, I put him into an um, early childhood development program at Cherry Elementary. And that program is where half of the, there's like 12 kids in a class, half of the kids are kids with special needs and the other half are peers. And I thought this is a great opportunity to start exposing them to really um, a variety of what life is going to be like when you get out there in that adult world. You're exposed to many different um, people. And so this is an opportunity for them to not be tainted um, gave them an opportunity to be able to see each, each individual for each other. And so through that, I kind of started taking cupcakes, uh, you know, they're to the preschool. And then I started hearing about the PTO or PTA. And so when they, both my boys, and they left there and went to Ottawa River School, I was like, um, that, you know, donuts for moms and, you know, boohoo's for moms or donuts for grandparents types of events. I signed up to volunteer and wanted to be really active in their school life. And um, a good friend of mine had reached out to me and said, hey, why don't you get involved with the parent organization there? So I, I did. And I also had a lot of questions about what is, you know, there were being cuts being made and I just didn't really understand why are we cutting into public education? So I thought, well, I'll get involved. I'll understand, which is some school board meetings, did a little bit more digging um, and got onto the parent group, did some more digging and said, you know, it's really not a lot of the local school board members issues uh, or they are their issues, but a lot of them are driven from what happens in Columbus. So from there, I went and did some lobbying in Columbus and um, went to the finance committee meetings and did um, speeches there and talked about why they should be funding school and 
that I thought, you know, we really got to rally our parents behind. So under Dr. Eugene Sanders, uh, we started a group called uh, the Parent Congress. And what this did is brought all those PTO presidents together so that we could all have a conversation about what's happening in their schools so that we could have a clear conversation with the administration. From that, just kind of people, there was openings on the school board um, in 2007 with a projected deficit of $125 million in five years. So ran to that job. Yeah. Um, and there was two people running. Well, there was about seven or eight people running for two seats. And that is also the year that Jack Ford um, said that, hey, I'm going to run for school board. I'm going to come from um, the state house and come down back to the school board and see if we could help. So ran a, a really amazing campaign. Um, came in about 600 votes behind then Mayor Jack Ford. So my first campaign ever running and thought, wow, that's pretty incredible. We did multiple debates, you know, The, the old way that we could do campaigning, um, <laughs> which is not the old way now because of the pandemic. Oh no. Times and knocked on doors, neighborhoods that, and lost 41 pounds at that time. <laughs> oh wow. But um, yeah, that was, that was a lot of walking that summer. Yeah. Some probably see me now, those are not, I found <laughs> every one of those excuse me, 41 pounds since then. But um, I have um, enjoyed serving on the school board for those eight years. Those are very good times and there were bad times. The bad times was the recession and the good times was I served the whole eight years I was on the school board on the construction committee. So when I drive around the city and see 44 brand new buildings and Two, two, um, two 100 year old high schools that have been renovated and other buildings that have been renovated. I take quite pride in that opportunity, especially as an opportunity as a woman. Uh, a lot of people said, you don't know anything about construction. I said, you're exactly right. I don't, but I will learn. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I, stood on, I stood on the top of Scott High School and, and looked at what they were going to do there for the roofing. I have um, been up in um, cupolas and saw, you know, 100 years of pigeon poop <laughs> for at Wait High School um, and learned how much it costs to get rid of 100 years worth of pigeon poo. Yeah. So um, valuable lessons. Yeah. Va very valuable lessons. lessons. Yeah. Clean your poo up before it's a hundred years old. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But your dishes, let them soak. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's such a cool path. And then, so you took a break after school board. How long were you just a regular citizen? <laughs> well, about two minutes. Um, yeah. like, I'm sure. It, it was around two years. Uh, but when I was on that school board, though, in 2010, I started working at Jobs and Family Services. I was a caseworker and really got uh, to see um, the myths on the people that are on government assistance, like collecting their food stamps, cash, and medical, because there's a lot of myths out there. Mm -hmm. And really enjoyed that opportunity to be able to help citizens and guide them towards an opportunity to get off of those benefits. And so that I, I say, everyone always asks me, what is your favorite job? And I say public service has been my favorite job. Me too. And you've been doing it forever. I mean, that kind of thing informs your service as, a, as an elected official too. I mean, having that experience working at JFS, I'm sure was invaluable yeah. in how you yeah. legislate. It's, it's been very valuable because I'm the only House of Representative member at the current time in the state of Ohio that has worked in the capacity of working at Jobs and Family Services mm -hmm. and understanding how that process works and what caseworkers go through to process those cases, but also understand the other side of the struggles that our most vulnerable population has to go through to mm -hmm. meet all those criteria and get all their information in so that their cases can be authorized. Yeah. yeah. So powerful. So 
when I was running last year, uh, you were actually the first female elected official to reach out to me and give me advice. Um, and then you continued to check in on me throughout my campaign, which I really appreciate. I think that was the most thoughtful thing because you and I didn't really know each other that well back then either. So um, I just really appreciate that. And then I see you doing it again with first time candidates this year, like Katie Moline. Um, so what inspired you to do that? Why, why do you think it's important for women to stick together like that? I think it's really important because something I discovered when I first started running and in other positions I have looked at, I, the predominantly male um, counterparts are always telling me as a woman, you're not ready. It's not your turn. Um, you have to wait. We have someone else in mind. And it was, I was like, wait a second, I'm having my hand up, mm -hmm. um, wanting to be involved. And then I, I also started witnessing that there was other women that were wanting to come up into the politics in this area and they were being told the same thing. So, and so I thought it was very important that the things that I had to go through and the things that I learned and some of them weren't so bright and cheery. Um, some are pretty doom and gloom that I didn't want any other female to have to go through those. So I thought it, I think it's just very important to reach out um, and be honest yeah. and um, bounce ideas off. My ideas aren't always the best and, but um, collectively together, we come up with some really good, uh, phenomenal things. I mean, look what you and Sky have done. I mean, this is just awesome what you guys are doing for our community and for women to get those messages out there. So supporting those. And if we're going to make any inroads, we have to support each other. And so, and that's, and that's sometimes through the hardest of times though, because, um, you know, we get, we get poked on and we get prodded on and we get told to, you know, take your chair and leave my table. Mm -hmm. And I just say, well, you can take my chair away, but I'm still going to stand here at your table. I might even stand up on top of your table. <laughs> because I, I just, I just not my type of personality to sit back and, and be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad we have you representing us at the state house. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Who are your role models? Uh, I will say my very, my, I come from a family with, there's five girls. I got four other sisters. And um, so I'm going to say my biggest role model has been my mother. Um, she's no longer here with us. Um, she died at a very young age from colon cancer, but she was a, a public school teacher in Missouri and she taught during the day, went and got her master's degree at night and made sure that all five of us girls got to where we needed to be. And, and she loved us so. And so if you think about your mom sewing every one of your Easter outfits or every one of your Christmas outfits or what have you, um, my mother would never start sewing until like 24 hours beforehand. So think about five <laughs> girls. <laughs> that, and I always dreamed that I'd wake up on Easter morning and I'd have part of the pattern still on the <laughs> outfit or all the um, pins in it. And we'd all be kind of sit real still so we wouldn't get poked with the pin. But no, she had them hanging, pressed, pins all out. And, and she would just, was just, I couldn't understand how she could just do this. Yeah. And so I saw her struggle, you know, um, through those, not really struggle, but she's determined. Mm -hmm. um, and so just watching her, she's been my, my biggest role model. And so, you know, I, I tell her all the time, I, I talk to her all the time going, mom, I, I hear you on my shoulder. You're slapping me about education. <laughs> You're slapping me about what these men are doing mm -hmm. um, and, and stay strong. So, She's just been my, my biggest role model. That's amazing. That's awesome. So talking about your mom slapping you for what these men are doing. <laughs> we, we've talked to a couple of state reps on this podcast so far. We talked to um, Paula Hicks Hudson, Juanita Brent. Um, so we've, we've said a number of times that the state house in Ohio is overwhelmingly male, white male. Mm -hmm. So how, what is it, what was it like your first term to kind of walk in you're a new woman, new, newly elected to all these men. And how, where do you find the strength to assert yourself, share your opinion, um, fight, you know, w w do whatever you have to do when it's, when you are surrounded by men? 
Well, I'll tell you that, that the day that we got sworn in July, this I mean, excuse, July, January 7th, I remember afterwards, my youngest son, I keep saying my youngest son, he's 20. Uh, <laughs> so I should say probably my youngest adult son um, <laughs> has said, you know, he, he comes up to me and he goes, wow, mom, he goes, there's a lot of white old dudes down there. <laughs> And I said, well, welcome to my world. And yeah. you're exactly right. And he goes, I could really see the divide in the house. He goes, I could really see where the Republicans sat and where the Democrats sat. And I said, well, well, besides a lot of old white dudes, what else did you recognize? And he goes, on the Democratic side, I could see diversity. I could see women on there. I could see black people on there. I could see, you know, panic on there and he goes that really resonated with him um just having that showing that picture in his mind and, he, and we still talk about it somewhat but um and i knew right then it was going to be an interesting time especially being a freshman legislator especially from toledo uh, because we're so just it seems like we're like disconnected in, from toledo to columbus yeah. But what I made sure that I did the first hundred days was I met with each one of the legislators and knocked on their doors, had meetings with them and had conversations about what like issues we have. So I felt like I couldn't start off my job if I didn't know my colleagues, kind of like that your first day on work, yeah. you kind of get to know who, yeah. who good, you know, water cooler people are and who's going to bring the brownies and, yeah. and who's going to pay for lunch or, or what have you. I and, love that idea. Yeah. That's awesome. He's kind of the cool kid. So that's what I said the first hundred days. And people kept saying, well, what's your bills? What's your bills? What's your bills? So none. I wanted to get to know my colleagues because you can't sure. start off just work without knowing who you're working with. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Brilliant idea. Everybody should do that. Get to know everybody on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, one piece of legislation that's introduced every term and, of course, was reintroduced your first term was the heartbeat bill. It essentially bans abortion in about six weeks in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. This bill is reintroduced every term and you stood up the first time it was reintroduced during your first term in a big way. Um, we've heard the story. Would you share that story with, the, with us? Um, and you talked about this on the floor. Yeah. Right? Yep, I did. And, and let me let me kind of set it up for you because yeah, I was please. approached about talking about this on the floor. And I said, okay, fine, I have no problems to people after you. You know, a lot of people are gonna look at you differently, they're gonna treat you differently, they're going to um, not have that um, it's just gonna be a little bit different. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I served in the military, you know, as first female firefighter instructor in the United States Navy as a listed personnel. So really things just really don't bother me anymore. Yeah. And I think it's probably just at that age, um, 50 some, that things just kind of roll off my shoulders anymore. And they back in the day probably did bother me. But regardless, we were taking that vote and I stood up and I told my story of when I was in the United States Navy, that I was, I was attacked, I was kidnapped, I was raped. Uh, from that rape, um, I found out right before I was getting ready to go to um, court um, to start the proceedings um, that I was pregnant. And now I'm just like going, oh, geez, what am I going to do here? And um, I had a lot of discussions. I had discussions with my family, with my pastor at the time, my priest actually at the time, and said, listen, you know, I just, and I, my family was in Missouri and I was in South Carolina. I'm one of the lucky folks because we actually got to catch this guy. Yeah. And the day that I was standing on the, on the, on the state house floor, Giving my story was a 30 year anniversary wow. of this gentleman being locked up in prison. Wow. wow. That day really had a big, meaningful part. Wow. And I, and I, you know, so it was, I, I went through, you know, from him attacking me in my house, forcing me into the house with a, 
what we found later was a hatchet that he made to look like a serrated knife. Uh -huh. um, and it did seem like hours and it probably maybe wasn't, but it just seemed like hours and weeks and days of this whole time that this process went on. Yeah. But from that though, we were fortunate to, and I remember, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, my um, stepmother was a rape crisis um, counselor. And so I remember her telling me as a kid and all of us girls as, as a kid, you know, something ever happens, you know, what to do. And you don't, you're thinking, yeah, it's never going to happen to me. But something came out in my mind that brought all those things that she had told us mm. to do. And that was get a fingerprint. How do you get a fingerprint? Would you like a glass of water? Mm. Wow. After you're done with the rape, would you like a glass of water? Because I was going to bust you. Um, he wanted my phone number. Um, I played dumb. I so I didn't remember my home phone number. I don't call mm -hmm. myself. He knew I had a bag phone because back then the cell phones are bag phones. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, wanted to know that phone number. I was like, don't call myself. He's like, what about work? I got work phone number. Oh, wow. I'm in the military, dude. We're going to get you. So I gave my work phone number and this happened on a weekend night. And that Monday I was back to work because I wanted to be there if he called we were going to catch him and he did what he called the work number he thought we were going on a date oh my god and so um like you and i are talking here my warrant officer was watching he was on the phone listening in too and, and the phones were tapped so they we had this all set up if he were to call and when we got done with the phone call we we, we got a date yeah the oh date to incarcerate you and catch you, dude. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so um, North Charleston Police Department, along with the military, a lot of undercover folks, set up a sting. He was coming to my house. I let him know with a police officer in the back of my car. They said, yep, that's him. And he caught on to it and took a high-speed um, high chase and wrecked his car. He went through uh, trailer parks and went up an expressway the wrong direction and went to a whole other little town. And so it was all in the papers there and they, they did catch him. But at the end of the day though, I know so many women that are rape survivors, rape victims yeah. that have not came forward uh, yeah. and don't always have, and they don't always have the strength. So there's so many stories that we don't know out there and from this, and from the blade, um, telling my story to all of Toledo, to all of Ohio, to everyone else that shared it out there. I've had a numerous of calls of people that's reached out. It's been it's been in different situations um, to say, you know, thank you. You're giving me the courage to go forward now. And some of those are actually some of the rape victims from the OSU wrestling team. Oh wow. Um, so they never had the courage until after they they'd heard the testimony and read articles to be able to come forward and that start it's a he healing process this Absolutely. is my healing process yeah. of talking about it yeah i mean thank you thank you for sharing this i i never knew the whole story and um and I, i'm also i am a sexual assault survivor as well um and i've had an abortion too. So, um, you know, different circumstances, but, um, when you said what you did on the floor to me as, uh, someone who was aspiring to be an elected official, I mean, that was just, it was so inspiring to me. It was so incredible to hear you say that, especially like we just said, it's a room full of mostly men and here you are basically slapping them with this right like she's like she stands up and she's like listen this is why you can't support the heartbeat bill because women like me get raped and then have to have an abortion like it was an incredibly powerful moment and mm -hmm. i'm i'm so proud of you and um you're inspiring to women like me all women like it was it was thank you for sharing that story i guess it's yeah. just um it's it's i don't i don't know how you say no to that but they did I do every year. <laughs> they did. Yeah. I do it all the time. But I, but, I, but I think, but it's, but I look at this with, they don't live in our bodies. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I would love to hear the debate if we were to take Viagra off of being, yeah. um, you know, part of an insurance plan. Yeah. Uh, what well, what would that debate be on the floor then? Yeah. Is this, would it be them talking about this is their bodies? Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe you might. Know they said, they things. they use that line when they don't want to wear a mask to save yeah. the country from the coronavirus, but yeah. Yeah. Is this small inconvenience? <laughs> yeah. No, it's in, it's incredible. Um, so what, like, so in that moment on the floor, when you did decide to share your story, did you keep it together? Were you crying? I didn't cry on the floor. I kept, I had a little voice in my head saying, don't cry because I was, you know, if you cry, it's, a, it, unfortunately it's viewed as a, as a sign of weakness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I was weak. It was, I'm so angry we're having yeah. to continue to have this conversation i mean i know like when i get so bad at my boys they'll be like mom why are you crying i know I'm I so do that angry. Too, I, yeah i gotta keep having this conversation yeah yeah my seatmate representative david leland from the columbus area you know he grabbed my arm he was like wow i didn't know now my sisters in the fight and the house democrats they they a lot of them knew my mm -hmm. stories but the men did not but I will, but walk, but the whole time telling my story, there are people in the state house chanting and there were people in the gallery, which we don't have them now because of COVID, but there were so many people that showed up. So I felt that I need to be strong for their voices. And afterwards, yes, I went and sat in the, in the bathroom and just sobbed. Yeah. I was like, wow, this was I, my, my first floor speech. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I'm a freshman. I, I barely even know where the bathroom is yeah. in the state house and just telling this, this whole experience, but also listening to my fellow colleagues and their experiences too. Yeah. But the strength was the people that showed up to fight the good fight that gave me the strength for not just bursting out in tears on the house floor. Uh, but I, like I said, yes, I went to the bathroom and I cried like a baby. <laughs> yeah. Some, it's cathartic sometimes. It's, yeah. I find it a big relief when I can just cry it out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, um, what, what kind of advice do you have to other women who may not have found their voice yet or may, may be too fearful to share their story or to stand up um, in a room full of men and, 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 and share a story like this? Like, uh, what, what, what can you tell other women um, to kind of give them some courage? Well, first of all, they're not alone. There's so many women out there that have gone, um, gone through sexual assault. There's so many women that have been through domestic violence. Uh, you are not alone. And um, I say, talk to, you know, we all have girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, have a cocktail or have a cup of coffee and, and talk with your girlfriends. And if you don't feel comfortable there is... Uh, you know, if the, I always found if I leave things inside, I fester, yeah. but I mean, I've gotten therapy. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. I love that. Um, it's actually <laughs> probably for a lot of people's benefits that I yeah. did do it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, going and talking to a therapist, mm -hmm. um, that's a safe space and, and work through that. And not every, not everybody works through it the same way that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, but how, and, and I talked with the wrestlers as, as a talk, you know, they were, they were married. They were, they were scared to tell their wives. And I said, well, first of all, they're, the, they're your wives because they love you. Yeah. And so they're, they're the, they're the judgment free zone. So have a conversation with them. Um, but you'll, you know, you, you know how to, how to deal with your own emotions. Everyone's different, but have a conversation, reach out to someone. Um, and if it's me that's gone through it, I'm fine with that. Cause sometimes we just need to yell and scream and mm -hmm. holler to get that out. And I have no problem being a listening ear and have been that for a long time to a lot of women. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. We yeah. shared yesterday for our 60 days of action, um, the Violence Against Women Act, um, some information, and there's a national domestic violence hotline and a sexual assault hotline. So we'll share that again in the show notes here. Yeah. Um, 
it's such a vital resource for folks who who need help and who need to talk to someone yeah absolutely yeah definitely well to we totally change direction uh you just had a super awesome letter to the editor in the toledo blade we will also link to this because mm -hmm. damn it's so good but, <laughs> um, so tell us why you're voting for biden and why well, you voted to write a letter to the editor well, I voted for Biden and uh, my arms are never long enough for all the reasons why I'm voting for Biden. But in regards to the letter to the editor that showed up in Sunday's paper is being a veteran, being a mom to um, a son that serves at the 180th, an aunt to two um, nephews that serve at the 180th, to being a sister-in-law to, you know, um, my brother-in-laws that have served in the Marines, the Army, um, to my dad that served in the Army, to my uncle that served in the Army and was captured in Korea. And um, we are not suckers and losers. Um, I will not call myself a hero, but my, my son's a hero. He was called up during COVID-19, um, not once, but twice to serve. And so he's not a sucker. Mm -mm. And, um, and when you sign up for service, you're signing up knowing that you potentially could be put into a situation that you may not come home. And um, I have a granddaughter now, and her dad <laughs> is not a sucker. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle that never made it home, he, spent, um, he left Okinawa, Japan to go over to Korea. Um, there was a group of five radial men. And... Um, two of them, were, I believe is how the story goes, two of them were shot on the hill and the other three were captured. And my grandmother, when she got the news that they were captured, was just, was devastated. You know, this is back in the day when, you know, they didn't have a lot of stuff to help depression. Mm -hmm. And she was just really devastated from this and had to fight the government to get him presumed dead so she could get his uh, re um his belongings back and, and all the things that come along with that. But still to this day, he's never came home. Yeah. And even though my grandmother's not with us and my mother is not with us, it is mine and my sister's, my four other sister's goal is to, when he's uh, found, because um, what the army does is that if there's no living relatives, mother or sister, they um, come by and take your DNA. So they took my DNA, my oldest sister's DNA, so they could match up if the remains were found. Mm -hmm. So that we could be able to um, take a hold of those. But mm -hmm. there's so many of those soldiers in the Korean, the Vietnam, World War I, World War II that did not come home. Mm -hmm. They were fighters. They were fighting to protect us. They were fighting. Um, they, they, stepped up to the call of duty, mm -hmm. just like so many did after 9-11, stepped up to the call of duty. And so I would, anyone that ever calls a military person a sucker or a loser, um, to me, is, is unfit um, to serve and unfit definitely to lead this country. Mm -hmm. And I and I have never spoke out before I was a before I was elected official, when I was in the service, I never spoke about politics. You just really didn't. Sure. Um, but I'm I, no more, no more. Well, and I feel like that's what we're seeing is a lot of these normally apolitical spaces in the government and in service are becoming politicized because yeah. Trump yeah. is making them, yeah, like, you know, do his bidding, and it's. Yeah just awful to watch especially i mean the post office right? right like that's one the cdc the 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 you know the the health organizations now yeah. like everything is so political because we are in this pandemic which it didn't have to be like this like none of this had to be this way uh, but now the military is being politicized in a in a very partisan way um yeah it's just a um it's like how did we get here <laughs> you know yeah. like i don't know um they i mean they made really calculated moves to get us here so yeah. we all have to vote in november so we can dig uh, ourselves out of this yeah 
Mouth. But we also can't forget something that's very important at the end of this month is we have to have our census completed. Yes. Yes. Uh, because that is going to, you know, it drives the funding to our state. It drives our funding to our schools. You know, it drives funding in so many different areas. And when I hear citizens that will say, well, why can't we have this anymore? Why can't we have that anymore? It's driven from the uh, majority of it's driven from the census. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sit here for 10 more years. If we don't get our numbers in the census, we're going to sit here for 10 more years going, why do we not have this? Why do we not have that? You, Lisa Sebecki, state representative, are not helping us out. Yeah. No, it, we have, we need to be able to count everyone. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that is not a, pol that's not political. Mm -mm. No. But in some regards, yeah. this occupant on 1600 Avenue that we're getting ready to, give him an eviction notice with, you know, no opportunity to go find a judge for it. We probably will try, but regardless, is that he's setting this up too. Think about, think about what you just said, Carrie, the post office. Yeah. You know, so their whole, you know, are people getting their census forms? You know, it's, yeah. it's all this maneuvering um, to have a dictatorship, in my opinion, um, opportunity to to rule over us and that's not what we are, americans are about yeah um, we're about free speech we're about being able to have peaceful protests and peaceful discussions and peaceful debates but he's bringing he's bringing a fight every single time there's a difference between a debate and there's a difference between a fight yeah, yeah. and he's just he's fighting every one of us every turn of the way that he can mm -hmm. yeah it's awful to watch. Yeah. No, it really is. Yeah. So enlightening and, and hope gives me so much hope to see your face and to hear about what you're doing in the state house. Yes. So thank you for joining us today. <laughs> so what are you working on in the state house? Like anything, um, can, what, what can we expect? Um, and, or next in your next term too, what can we expect? Well, um, I will be taking every one of the bills that I did not get passed out of the house, which I didn't get. I only got one bill passed out of the house and I'm waiting for the Senate. And that's the name. August 18th is Jean Krantz Day. If, I'm not sure if you all heard, Jean Krantz is um, from, a graduate from Central High School. Okay. He was in charge of Mission Control, um, Man of the Moon, as oh, we all know. Yeah. And our airport just the name change, you just got changed there at Gene Krantz. So I was hoping that that would be an opportunity we'd have um, as Gene Krantz Day here. But every bill that I have um, introduced, I will be reintroducing in the next General Assembly and reintroducing and reintroducing until we get a pass. Yeah. But uh, one of the biggest bills that I have been doing a lot of work on, though, is around domestic violence and uh, rent. Uh, because a lot of women are scared to leave the domestic violence situation they're in is because they're on a lease. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're still responsible for that lease. And, but they, they didn't ask to be beat up. Yeah. They didn't ask to be um, victimized. And so this is a bill that would allow domestic victim violence, um, domestic victims to be able to get out of their leases and get to a safe space so working a lot around there yeah uh, but what i've kind of been doing you know it's been a hundred think about this 173 days since the ohio house has passed any meaningful legislation to address covid oh my god wow. 173 days now we met they brought us down there um we before last so we were going to have the butterfly naming bill which is okay important um i'm, I'm you know a fossil naming bill <laughs> hmm. how's that helping ohio ones yeah. oh man um so anywhere i mean you know trying to work anywhere from about um 10 to 17 hours a day wow. seven days a week since march um helping because constituents be able to get their unemployment, find out why unemployment hasn't been able to be had, um, find, and, and just meeting the needs of not only my 120,000 plus constituents that I have in my district, 
but the 11.7 million Ohioans. Mm -hmm. And you know, our House Democrats, we represent 4 million constituents together. So our voices have not been heard. We've not gotten bills passed. We've not, you know, it's like, who care? You know, the other side of the aisle is kind of like, kind of giving the bird to say, hey, um, we don't care about those 4 million Ohioans. We only yes. care, care about our Ohioans. Yeah. Um, so this is really why another reason other than changing the top of the ticket of who's the president, but electing um, Democrats to have more, because we're the super minority. If we just flip a few more seats, we get out of mm -hmm. that and then we become relevant. Right. Uh, and they're really going to have to work with us. So this is why it's super important that um, we get an opportunity to change and flip some of those seats. Yeah. And I am confident with, um, you know, our people that are, um, Alexis Miller that's running over in the Port Clinton area, um, Nancy Larson's that's, yeah. that's running over here in Sylvania um, area and stuff is really going to be making a difference with us down there in Columbus. Yeah. A lot of women running. Um, which is awesome. Do you think that more women down there will change things? Like, couldn't we actually get stuff done if we have more women down in Columbus? I would say if we had more women in charge, um, because women, we can multitask. Mm -hmm. You know, we could try to get onto a Zoom, and if something doesn't work, we know how to get to something else. At the same mm -hmm. time, we're probably making dinner. <laughs> At the same time, we're probably stuffing envelopes or we're, or we're doing um, spelling words with our kids. We right. could do multiple, multiple, multiple things. So I would just be floored if we had women in charge yeah. in Columbus. And I often make the comment to my colleagues that I'm just going to bring a dustpan and broom down because mm -hmm. I feel like that's what Democrats do every time that we're rushed down to Columbus is to, to clean something up at the other side of the aisle messed up. Yeah. 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 And I think that's that the, the pandemic has been so hard on women, I think, more so than men. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately, just if we had more women in power, would the legislature be so worried about things like abortion and, you know, other things that guns, or would we actually mm -hmm. be getting like free or reduced childcare for the kids that have to do like online school now and the, for the moms that have to go to work and like we, mm -hmm. we, women are faced with all these like super tough choices during the pandemic, whether or not your kid's going to go to school in person or stay home with you. If they stay home with you, what does that mean? Do I leave my job or do I just work from home? It, like it's, it's all of these complicated issues that I feel like are falling on women's shoulders. And to hear you say that we haven't even had any like serious bills passed in the last 170 some days is crazy to me because like women are struggling right now. We, we've got yeah. a lot of issues. We've got issues. We've got a lot of <laughs> issues, issues, especially, and then just uh, like magnified because of the pandemic, right? Like it, we already had issues. We know we already had issues, but yeah. now with the pandemic, it's like everything is worse. And so I guess I've just been thinking about that a lot lately, that if we had more women making these decisions that are important to us, I think we would be a lot farther along. Yes. I, I would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 from so from experience. Yeah. From a little yeah. experience. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So what are you doing in the next okay, I think we're like 49 days away from the election. What are you doing Ooh. up until election day? Um campaigning for Biden a little bit, campaigning for yourself a little bit. Um how you're are on, you you're on the ticket. You're on yeah. the ballot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how are you um like, what are your plans up until election day? Oh, and tell us what your voting plan is, too. What, how, how are you going to vote? In person, mail? What are, what are your plans? Be ballot, um, because I'm, I have a, a sick feeling in my stomach that we're going to need some help on election day. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be there to be an assistant, whatever way we can, answer questions and, and get people to the correct um, polling locations. But between here and November 3rd, continuing continue to do my job uh, first and foremost and that's not being a wife or a mom or grandma that's being a state representative I've told them that they got to wait be on hold I'll get back to you guys around you know 7 31 p.m on November 3rd and, and, and they're used to this in our house yeah. you know yeah uh, but 
is continuing to fight and um, to work towards making sure we have the right people in office. Um, if that means go to door to door, hang out a sign or what have you, make phone calls, raise money, um, and just in, and continue to introduce other candidates to that layer of folks that are out there that maybe they've not got those introductions. So just continuing to do that um, and making phone, I mean, I'm making phone calls all day long. If one thing people don't know about me and my friends all know, I like to talk. <laughs> and Same. I get a lot done on the phone. So <laughs> you might hear me cleaning my bathrooms as I'm talking to you on the phone, but that's what we do to get the job done or doing Multi laundry or cooking dinner. Yeah. Multitasking, yeah. multi multitasking, yeah. but um, but it's just working every moment up until election day. Uh, it, it also could be my neighbor might need to have her absentee ballot dropped off downtown because she's yeah. uncomfortable with the mail. Yeah. So you know, if it's whatever I need to do, I'm there and continuing just to just strive to not only get myself reelected but to help others get elected with me because. If I don't have, if I don't have allies and friends, it makes it a little bit hard. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We are we your ally and friends. Yes. Yeah, we are. Oh, I know. You and guys we are lovely. And your help on Katie's campaign, too. I mean, yeah. gosh, it's so, it's so powerful. And you've become a, a huge mentor and inspiration for her, which is really great yeah. to see. I'm yeah. just, so I'm excited for Katie. She is, she, I, I just, I've, and, you know, and really, I've watched you guys from, from afar, and we have some very inspiring um, young ladies in our area. And you know, with Katie, she is just doing a yeoman's job, and she she's down. You know, she can get down and in the weeds, and she can get down there and figure out the solutions. Yeah. Um, Carrie and Sky, both of you guys do your own parts in our community though. So keep doing those parts, things like this, if, if ha talking about these difficult um, conversations and not everyone wants to have a talk about because let's face it, rape and abortion is not really something that people like to have a conversation with over their dinner table, but it's reality. Yeah. Domestic yeah. violence is reality in our community. Yeah. Gun violence is a reality in our community. And so until we, until we can have those, um, reality conversations, we're really going to continue to fight the, the, the same old fights. Yeah. So I thank you guys for this opportunity and the platforms that you give people to be able to have conversations outside of social media, though, but your platform within our community and the good work that you guys do do. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for, for lifting us up and you mm -hmm. pushed me last year when I needed it and reached out to me when I needed it. And I just, that I mean, I want to, that's what I want to be when I am an elected official. I want to make sure that I am also lift, lift as we climb. That's what Nan Whaley told us, right, Sky? Like we want to lift other Carrie women up with us. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, to talk to you, but um, I, I hope that our, our listeners fell in love with you too. Um, where can they, where can our listeners follow you? or donate to your campaign, or where can they um, reach out to you? You can reach out to me on my Facebook, Lisa Sabagi, or really that's the best place through my Facebook. If you want to donate to, come at, to my campaign, uh, reach out to me on social media, and I can tell you how to, uh, where to send those checks. Mm -hmm. um, I do also have an Act Blue account, so if you go to Act Blue, you can give to Lisa Sabagi there. Uh, but, or also you can, a lot of people know where I live, just drop <laughs> that check off right at my house and, and I'll exchange you for a yard sign or two or three that I have there here too. Go. So <laughs> stay tuned to Facebook to, um, my picture of my fall decorations in my front yard. I think everyone will love them. Okay. Um, I'm, I've got a little pun going there with all my yard signs. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love well, it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Th thanks for everybody who tuned in. Um, we're not really getting the um, comments today because we're on a different <laughs> platform today, but that's okay. But however, uh, we will be back next Tuesday for a brand new episode. Our guest next Tuesday is a fellow girls girl um, that you guys might recognize, Brienne Godfrey. She's a first time candidate 
and she is running for trustee up in Bedford, Michigan. And wow, is that race oh. wild right now? Oh, like it is my God. really heating up. Um, and so I can't wait to talk to her about kind of the struggles that she's going through because, um, it's kind of unreal what is happening up in that small town. So she's going to be on next Tuesday. And then we will, we promise we will have somebody on from um, the Biden campaign. Um, it's a surrogate. We are hoping it's a super big celebrity. So um, that's, and maybe that's why they had to uh, postpone. So I'm crossing my fingers that it's Michelle Obama, although I've already been Ooh. told, no, but I'm still crossing Ooh. my fingers. I just want to. You know what I had a dream about though? What? Samantha B. I don't even oh. know if he's a surrogate, but I, you know, she's hilarious. And he's hilarious. Obviously, would be our best friend once we talk to her. Obviously, so. yeah. Just yeah, putting no, that out. So you know. We we're excited. Um, it's going to be a surprise to us too, probably until the day before. So, um, well, we should have them on in the next few weeks to talk all things Biden, um, leading up to November third. So. Uh, tune in next week. Uh, we'll be here on Facebook and, uh, don't forget to like, rate, review, and subscribe. Um, also we have our 60 days of action going on too. So, um, if you haven't subscribed to the emails, you can also, um, see our post here to see just how to help out little, little ways to help out every, every day, um, until the election. So we can all kind of do our part, um, and don't leave any cards on the table. Right. So, um, right. so thanks Lisa and thanks for joining us. And we'll see everybody next week. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.